number two. Do you have it with you? Do I? Okay, I think I do. Uh, that's, it says a 10 kilogram mass undergoes a collision, blah, blah, blah. Is that the one? Okay. Okay, so it says a 10 kilogram mass undergoes a collision with the floor lasting 0.03 seconds. So, um, before the collision, it has a speed of 10 meters per second, 10 degrees from vertical. So, if this is vertical, um, I'm going to imagine this is a ball, mass of 10 kilograms. And um, before the collision, it comes in at an angle like that with a speed of 10 meters per second. And this angle is 10 degrees. And then after the collision, it has a speed of 8 meters per second, 12 degrees from vertical. So um, it bounces off like this. Um, the speed now is 8 meters per second. It's lost a little bit of speed uh, in the collision. And this angle is 12 degrees. Um, what's the average net force during the collision? And second, uh, what's the average contact force applied to the ball during the collision? Um, so first of all, uh, this is a this is in the category of collisions, explosions, impacts. So um, you know you're going to use some kind of linear momentum thing. Uh, you also know you're going to use some kind of linear momentum thing because it's in a set of problems that says linear momentum. But that way of doing it doesn't work most of the time, you know, like on a test or whatever. So what, what you want to get used to doing is looking at this problem and saying, okay, like I can see this is a short duration impact. We're dealing with a collision, an explosion. And so I'm looking for a momentum. thing. And now there's two ways you can treat momentum. There's two types of problems. Who remembers what those two approaches are? Yep, exactly. Uh, impulse momentum equation and uh, conservation of linear momentum. And this one is going to be the impulse momentum equation because it's a, it's a collision between an object where we know the mass and stuff and an object where we don't know the mass. I mean, you could look up the mass of the Earth, but that's, that's not helpful. Actually, would it be? You might be able to do it that way now that I think about it, but let's not. Um, okay, so this is impulse momentum equation. And I guess I would say maybe there's two things that sort of give you a clue that this is the way we want to go. The first one is that 
we don't know the mass of one of those objects. And the second thing is um, we're trying to figure out something about the force applied to one of the objects. Um, Both of these make it really hard to see how conservation of linear momentum would help you. And so, okay, at that point, we feel pretty good about going with the impulse momentum equation. So the impulse momentum equation says the change in the momentum is equal to the integral of the force with respect to time from instant one to instant two. And if all we want is a average force, and this, this is the net force, that's important. And if all we want is the average force, we can think of this as um, the average net force over this time interval. You know, that's the same thing as saying, uh, the average net force um, times the elapsed time. Okay, well, now uh, if we think about it this way, uh, we pretty much have everything to solve for that average net force. We know the delta T, we know the elapsed time. Uh, we can calculate both of the two momentum vectors and subtract them. So uh, before the collision, I'll call it P1, is the mass of the ball times the velocity vector before the collision. Um, what angle would you use for cosine and sine with with that motion before the collision? 280, yep. Uh, 100 would be, so be careful. Uh, you, to get that angle, you have to put the tail of the vector at the origin of the coordinate system. So 100 is going exactly the opposite direction of what we want, so 280. Um, uh, and, the velocity is 10, so 10 times cosine of 280, 10 times sine of 280, and so that is 10 times 1.74, negative 9.85, I think. And then multiply that out and you get, um, 17.4 for the x component, negative 98.5 for the y component. And the units of linear momentum are kilogram meters per second. And after the collision, P2 is the mass, that stays the same. Uh, and then what's the angle that we want to use for that velocity vector? 78, yep. So, and this time the speed is eight. So we're multiplying this by eight times cosine of 78. 
8 times sine of 78. Can someone calculate that? I don't know the cosine and sine of 78. Okay, 7.86, 83. And that's still, we have to multiply by the 10, right? Must be. So we get 16.6 uh, .6 for X and 78.3 for Y. Um, change in linear momentum is the later one minus the earlier one. So um, we have 16.6, 78.3, minus 17.4, negative 98.5. Um, and so that's negative 0.8. And uh, 71, 76.8. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And uh, kilogram meters per second. And now we can put it into the uh, impulse momentum equation. So we have negative 0 0.8, 176.8 is equal to the average net force times uh, the duration of the impact is 0 0.03 seconds. And so now divide um, both sides of the equation by 0 0.03, and what do you get for the average net force? So negative 0 0.8 divided by 0 0.03. Negative 26.7, okay. Sorry, say it again. And that's Newton's, and that's the answer to part A. <clears throat> so it's a big net force. Um, now that's assuming that that force is constant over the interval. Um, that's all we're going to do in, in this class, but you could assume a lot of different shapes and um, fit the fit those shapes of the impact profile to, you know, whatever you want and calculate maximum forces and stuff. So you can see that's a really big force. That's often going to be the case with these um, impact problems. So that's part A. And then part B, it says, um, what's the average contact force? Well, the idea here is now we're just going to split up the net force into individual forces. If you think of this ball like this is supposed to be during the impact, um, there's a downward force, the weight, it has a mass of 10, so this is a downward force of 98.1 newtons. And then there's a contact force, I'll call that. FC. Okay. 
And the net force is just equal to the sum of those. The net force is, is just the sum of all the forces. So you can think of this as negative 26.75893.3 repeating is equal to zero, negative 98.1. plus FCX, FCY, um, and so the contact force is negative 26.7, and then add 98.1 to this, um, so 5891.1, one three repeating, I think. Uh, five nine nine one. Okay, and this is the average contact force. And you can see why. Um, a lot of times we just don't even bother to figure out this to separate the contact force and the and the weight force. Percentage wise it's such a small difference, you know. That's just that's not always the case with impacts, but it's often the case. You have because these impacts are spread over a very short time, you get these really big forces and uh, they sort of frequently kind of dwarf the weight force. Any questions about that one? <clears throat> Any other homework questions? So now we're going on to the next topic. Yep. Uh, The work energy principle and conservation of mechanical energy. Um, and let me give a little uh, roadmap for uh, the how we're going to go through this. Um, you know, the order of topics in this section. Uh, we're going to first talk about a mathematical preliminary, the dot product. Bless you. Um, second, uh, we're going to talk about work, um, and work is a change in energy that's produced by the application of a force. Um, so there's two things that are sort of interesting about work. First of all, uh, work is not an amount of energy. A thing doesn't have a certain amount of work. It does have a certain amount of energy. 
Um, you can think of that sort of the same way as like displacement is a change in position and an object doesn't have a, it doesn't have a displacement at an instant. It does have a position, you know, but displacement is a change in position. It's sort of the same idea with work. And the second thing is there are a bunch of ways to change an object's energy. Um, one way to change its energy is to hold it up next to a radiator or whatever, you know, that changes the object's energy. Uh, so work is not just a general change in energy. It's a very specific kind of energy change. It's the kind you get if you apply a force to it. Okay, and so we'll talk about what that is mathematically using that idea of a dot product. Um, third, we'll define kinetic energy. Well, we've already defined that very briefly in talking about um, elastic uh, conservation of linear momentum for elastic collisions. Um, then we'll talk about the work energy principle. Um, this is the most general um, energy equation uh, when all energy is mechanical. So we won't be able to do any problems in this whole section, like all of, all of this new topic, work energy principle and conservation mechanical energy. We won't be able to deal with anything with big changes in thermal energy. Um, what other types of energy? Uh, we won't be able to deal with anything where there are big losses in energy due to uh, you know, sound or heat. Um, as long as almost all of the energy, the big bulk of the energy that we're dealing with is mechanical, uh, this is the most general equation we'll have. Uh, then we'll talk about potential energy. Um, and this is something that only exists for, um, you can think of it as force fields. There'll be a couple of kinds of force fields we'll talk about. None of them are as cool as like in Super Friends. Um, like gravity is a pretty boring force field, but I'll talk about what a field is and, um, and if, something can be expressed as a force field, not all forces can, but if something can be expressed as a force field, then you can talk about its potential energy. And then finally, you know, these are gonna be short sections, so this isn't gonna take like months or anything, but uh, finally we'll get to conservation of mechanical energy. Um, this equation is not as general as the work energy principle, so it doesn't work for everything. But when it does hold, you can use it, it's a lot simpler to use.
So it's simpler when it does apply. When it does hold. Okay, so the first thing we have to talk about is the dot product. Um, uh, so up until now, here are the vector calculations we've done. We've done a few vector calculations. Um, adding vectors, we've multiplied a vector by a scalar. But so far, we haven't ever multiplied two vectors together. Um, and there are two main ways to multiply two vectors together. Um, the first one is well, the one we won't do is cross product. And the cross product, uh, you have two vectors as input. And you get one vector output. And because the output of the cross product is a vector, sometimes this is called the vector product. The cross product is super important in dynamics. Um, when we get to, uh, well, in circular motion, it's super important. We didn't use that approach, but in dynamics, you'll do it that way. Uh, it's important when you get to rigid body kinetics. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But for now, we're not going to use this. Um, maybe later we'll talk about it a little, but it's not really going to be a key thing that we'll use. Um, and then the second type is called the dot product. And the dot product is different because, well, you still have two vectors input. You're still multiplying two vectors. But the output you get isn't a vector, it's a scalar. Um, and because of that, People sometimes call this the scalar product. Um, there are two main ways to calculate the dot product. The first way is if the two input vectors, the two vectors you're multiplying, are already expressed as components. The 
They're already known as components. So let's say um, we're multiplying uh, a vector ax, ay, and then the symbol is a dot, dot product, and we're multiplying that by the vector b with components bx, by. Then the output is just you multiply the two x components, multiply the two y components, and add those two together. So um, ax times bx plus ay times by. And notice that at output, since you're not, you don't have any components in your answer, so. Uh, this answer is just a scalar. It can be any real number. Um, Second, if the two input vectors are known as magnitudes and directions, um, So let's say we have, uh, so for example, um, let's say that we have this vector u. Let me use a and b again. Let's make that a. And we want to multiply that by the vector b. Then put the vectors tail to tail. And calculate the smallest angle between them. So in this case, here's our vector B, put them tail to tail. Here's our vector A. This angle is going to be called theta. Um, the smallest angle between them is this angle theta. You could go the other way around too. That would be bigger. So this is the one we want. And then A dotted with B is equal to the length of the two vectors, magnitudes, times the cosine of the angle between them. Um, any questions about those? So basically, there's one way to do it if you know the vectors as lengths and directions. There's a different way to do it if you know them as components. Those two ways obviously have to, have to agree with each other. And now, there's something I want you to notice about this. And uh, the easiest way to see it is to look at this cosine definition.
So first of all, if the two vectors are within 90 degrees of each other, then the dot product is positive. If the input vectors are more than 90 degrees apart, and again, we're talking about the smallest angle between them, uh, then the dot product is negative. And then if the input vectors are perpendicular, then the dot product is zero. Uh, those are all important things to remember about the dot product. Those are really useful facts to, to use the dot product with. Um, let's do a couple examples. Um, so let's say u is equal to 3, negative 4. Um, v is equal to 2, 0. Um, first, let's calculate u at v. Second, let's calculate v dot u. Um, and then third, does the sign make sense? Okay, so for part A, um, we have three negative four dotted with two zero. Multiply the two x components, multiply the two y components, add them together, and you get 6. Second, v dotted with u, I'm just going to change the order and do it again. Multiply the two x's, multiply the two y's and add them together, and you get the same thing. So one thing to remember about the dot product is the order of operation doesn't matter. And then as far as making sense out of the directions. Uh, so let me draw a coordinate system. We have our first vector go positive. So one, two, three, one, two, three, four. So our first vector is this. That's our vector u. Our second vector is this. That's V. Um, is the 
angle between those vectors when they're tail to tail greater than or less than 90 degrees. So u dot v and v dot u should both be positive, and that's what we got. Any questions about that? Okay, let's do the quiz.